All right, I guess we'll get started. Thanks. Welcome to the Open Source Summit. Now, so uh, this session is uh, mentorship as an on-ramp to open source. We're going to be talking about exactly that. Uh, there are two housekeeping items. One, if you have a question, it's mostly going to be freeform. So if you do have a question when someone's talking, raise your hand, and uh, I'll call on you. We can start having a discussion more than just a, a one-way conversation. Uh, but if you do want to scan a QR code, uh, there, there's a form you can fill out, and I'll get the question on my phone uh, if you don't want to talk. And also, a big takeaway from this is we're going to be talking about a very big topic, which is mentorship and getting into open source. Uh, we're not going to solve anything or get any diamonds of knowledge in 40 minutes, but we might in the next 40 months. So this is an uh, interest group, I suppose you could say. It's a group of people. We just met during a virtual call on mentorship. Uh, and we said, hey, there's nowhere that we can go to continue this conversation. So we made a group of people here to talk about it. And we have a Discord server. We continue these calls, these conversations. Uh, in there, we're going to have regular monthly calls. I think it starts May 23rd is the first one. So with that said, uh, quick introduction. I'm Jonathan Starr. I'm the program manager of the Open Source Science Initiative out of NumFocus, where we are very interested in starting a mentorship program. That's why I was in that virtual meeting, and all of these people run mentorship programs. <laughs> so I was there to ask questions. Uh, and now I suppose we just go down the line. Hi there. My name is Kevin Wang, and I'm the founder of the Mentors in Tech program. We work with uh, students at smaller, more affordable, accessible uh, colleges, usually non-traditional students, and uh, help them enter the uh, tech industry through um, open source as, as a part of the, the work. Cool. I'm Tyler. I'm the executive director of Code Day. We're a nonprofit that helps students uh, make their first open source contributions in uh, anywhere from three weeks to two months. Um, we match them up with a mentor, and we match them up with an open source project, and uh, we've had uh, about a thousand pull requests merge to date. So um, that's us. I am Kendall Nelson. I'm a senior upstream developer advocate at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. Um, we partner with a lot of universities to get uh, open source in front of students while they're still working on their degrees. So I coordinate with members of faculty at mm, half a dozen to a dozen universities. And um, then I coordinate on the project side to make sure there are mentors and projects ready for students to work on them. Cool. Uh, I'm Emily Lovell. I'm a, a postdoctoral fellow at UC Santa Cruz in uh, one of the kind of smattering of open source program offices that are at academic institutions right now. Um, so we're pretty new, but we have a couple mentorship programs. Um, we have the open source research experience with Stephanie Leegy, who just walked in. She really directs that program. Um, uh, that engages a lot of students in academic open source research projects. And then I also uh, lead a new program called Contributor Catalyst, where we partner with HBCUs to have small cohorts of HBCU students uh, learning about open source and how to be a contributor. Awesome. Uh, so we'll get, well, actually, room check. Uh, who here is a mentor in some sort of mentorship program? Couple. Okay. Who has been a mentee? That's awesome. Uh, who works at an org or with an org that might be interested in starting a mentorship program? That's even, that's amazing. Uh, and who already has a mentorship program besides obviously these folks? I like the maybe back there. All right, this is awesome. So <laughs> we'll get started with this. Again, if you have a question or you have a thought that comes up as someone's talking, just raise your hand and uh, I'll, I'll get to you when we get there. Um, but yeah, so obviously a lot of interest in mentorship. You all run these programs. Why do we run these programs? Why is this so important in this field? Uh, even from tech to open source in tech. Um, and whoever wants to go. So I think one of the one of the really big things is that uh, for from the student perspective, uh, students have gone through for you know many, many years of their life having a professor who sort of tells them what to do and having a textbook that all the answers are there and you take tests and you're supposed to know the answers to everything. And open source is an amazing opportunity for students um, to make a real contribution and actually sort of learn the practice of engineering versus just all of the individual skills. Um, so we've seen that the students have gotten a, a ton out of it and uh, helps make them a lot more work ready. Anyone else? 
So kind of a, a different perspective. The open source projects are always looking for new contributors. I'm sure you've heard that throughout the last couple of days. Um, but we, so the, the foundation that I'm employed by also hears from our members that there is a little bit of a hiring vacuum, that they want to have more people that have open source experience. So programs like this that get students involved in open source before they even start applying for jobs gives them an edge. And um, we want to try to help support open source and more companies, obviously. So anything we can do to fill that void, um, I think, is one huge reason why we participate in these programs. Also, like bringing new people into your open source project brings even more new people into your open source project because, like, they they figure out like, oh, your build instructions are wrong. Like, let let's fix that. Like, yeah. building better contributor documentation. Like, it's a self reinforcing thing. The more people that you're bringing into your project, the more people are going to feel welcome into your project. Yeah, it also makes projects more healthy because it adds diversity, which is the track that I think we're on today. So the uh, new perspectives um, and different backgrounds are always helpful in, in making a community more robust. Yeah, actually to that point, I was gonna say one of the ways that I got involved in all of this is uh, my dissertation research was really interested in broadening participation in computing and how do we support more people coming into computing and feeling welcome here. And I think like just absolutely critical to that is relationships that people have. Um, I know that's like a big part of why I'm still in computer science. Um, so I think that it's really powerful to have these programs where students can build or contributors of any kind can build relationships with peers that are maybe also going through a program um, with like mentors who are teaching them like how to open source. Um, and then also with other community members who are just organically in a project. I think that's like such a profound thing for, uh, for newcomers to experience especially. And we work specifically with the non-PhD granting institutions, because I think it's just sort of where open source comes from, like BSD and things like that. There's usually kind of like a focus on R1 schools, but there's so many now, there's so many students graduating out of non-PhD granting institutions with CS degrees and the open source community is kind of missing like a third of, or you know, anywhere from a third to a half of all new CS grads. And so it's important for us to have uh, them get some exposure to open source, like Tyler said, and create a win-win situation for the students who uh, can be exposed to real software engineering skills, uh, doing doing builds, you know, failing lots and lots of automated tests and things like that, and kind of you know go through code reviews with real engineers, and build those software engineering muscles in a real-world situation that they otherwise would not get, but at the same time. Um, the, the they get to see what open source is uh, because most of the students only see the big tech companies out there and they usually have not heard of open source. So it's, you know, creating these kind of win-win situations, I think is crucial to, uh, to, to both for the health of the open source community as well as the just, you know, embracing the new students and the different types of students that are coming into computer science as a, as a field. So keeping both ecosystems healthy is really important. I think that's a really good point. It speaks to like the, the tech aspect of it, learn a skill, learn how to use GitHub. And then the community aspect that we were also talking about, the, <laughs> has anyone had that experience? Does everyone remember that first experience in open source where you're, you're like, this is, this is a little awkward. Like you have a fight with someone online and you just don't know, is this how the entire thing happens? And uh, yeah, so having a mentor in that experience is probably very useful. I did not in mine. So I was, I just had to fight through it and decide, Hey, I like open source. So I'm sticking around. But <laughs> if you have someone you can go to and be like, Hey, what, what's this? And they kind of walk you through that awkward experience. That's very helpful. Um, I guess maybe let's, let's dig into that cohort aspect where you have maybe a mentor and you have some peers, you, you go through a, a class graduation, I suppose would be a way to think about it. Do any of your programs do that? Or is it all one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentor mentee? Um, yeah. Yeah. So we have industry mentors um, who are in real life, like usually software engin uh, engineering managers run the student teams. So there is a buffer between open source, like anonymous people they see on the screen in open source and, and what they're getting. So, you know, just in case they, you know, 
uh, someone gets an email that's like Linus's email from 15 years ago, like there's some of it was like, okay, this is kind of, uh, you know, this is how you should respond to it. This is, you know, how we, we do want to protect our students a little bit because you don't know who you're going to get in various, uh, uh, various projects. But I think, uh, you know, now I think things are a lot more mellower. So I think that's, you know, the way we see 15 years ago doesn't happen. Anymore. But still, like, you know, people figuring out how to even go through a code review, how to ask something, or figure out how to ask something in the right way, or how to respond to something. So there's a lot of these things that as a software engineer that you need to communicate, and also um, you need a guide. You need someone that you can chat with, like at least Zoom with, and, and, and lead you to where it is. So um, the percentage of students that'll continue to fully successfully do a PR is is um, a lot higher than just kind of like have okay whoever can survive this you know the special forces you know training course you know the three we get at the end from the hundred that started that that's who we get we want to have like a higher uh, as high success rate as possible for the students because there's so much to learn from it and we don't want to scare them away at the at the at the very get go. Let's toss this down. I'm curious with the peers aspect too. Does having a peer go through the same experience help as well? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Our um, One of the programs I mentioned, Contributor Catalyst, where we're working with small uh, cohorts of HBCU students. So we're just about to start our second year. So we're still very early in figuring a lot of things out. But um, last year we had four students that I worked very closely with throughout the summer. And then we had like a number of sort of like guest mentors or people that they were engaging with from uh, both open source research and from the industry side. and. I think it's I think it's really great for 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 new contributors to get to have an experience where they they have that peer contact um, because they would often sort of like brainstorm amongst themselves or go break up into teams and do sort of like two teams that were pair programming together and then bubble up their questions to me and then I could do things like model like how do I solve a problem someone else kind of mentioned that earlier um, or how do you approach the community and I think it's it kind of gives like, yeah, just like a sort of micro community within the community of the project that they're contributing to. So like at the beginning, you know, one example I use frequently when I'm teaching or working with students is at the start, they'll often be working together to write like that first Slack message to someone in the community and be really nervous. Like, oh, Emily, can you like read over this message? Like, we think this person is in charge of this thing. and you know, we really want to see if they'll give us five minutes. And then by the end of our time working together, they're just like off flourishing, like solving things and having their own debates in the community about like why this bug that's three years old should be like opened up so that they can actually try and fix it. Um, so yeah, I think that's really cool. And then another thing we're trying out uh, as we grow our program is bringing back alumni mentors. And I, I think some of you can also speak to that. Um, that it can be really cool to have people return to your program who've gone through it and really have like a common experience with the participants who are coming into it. So it's also about like building a larger community of people that are giving back and nurturing the next the next generation. One interesting thing too is like what even is a peer, right? I, the way that we have our program structured, every month we have uh, 30 to 60 students who are starting making their first uh, open source contribution. We do teams of two to four students and one mentor. The mentors we pick, we, we specifically pick mentors who don't know that much about their open source project. Uh, we don't want people who are experts. We want the mentors to actually kind of be like, not exactly a peer, but like pretty close, right? Like they don't know what they're doing either. And that actually gives them the opportunity to, as, as Emily just mentioned, like model that behavior of like, here's what I do when I don't know how to solve a problem. So we, we kind of think of the mentors as, as something kind of analogous to a peer as well. And, you know, we have a group of two students, one mentor, and week one, the students feel like, man, I, I don't know anything. I don't know what's going on. Either this class sucks or, you know, or, uh, or I suck. And then week two, they meet with their mentor and then it's like, well, the mentor actually feels exactly the same way. And that, that's super valuable. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think kind of circling back, you were asking about like the, the different mechanisms within mentoring and our program 
has two different setups. Um, so depending on the university we partner with, some universities prefer an internship sort of program. So they have like an open source lab. And so they have like a faculty member that's kind of advising, um, but they are not a open source contributor maybe, or they just are looking for additional help. So I will, that that's more of a like one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So I find somebody in the community that's willing to help some student get involved and get moving um, and hopefully can kind of taper off how much help they need directly from that one mentor and start relying more and more on the community and being a fully fledged community member. Um, but then the other mechanism that um, we see a lot is like a group of students that are working together, but also working with one or maybe two mentors uh, within the community to get going. And then that is often really valuable to mentors because they know that the students can work together before they come to the mentor. So I am always continually worried about my mentors and burning them out. So whenever I can like rotate them through these kinds of programs to kind of balance the load and continually check in with my mentors, I definitely make sure to do that. Um, Cause mentoring is, it's, it's an investment, but it's a really valuable one. I'm saving a money question for later. Cause I don't want to go, <laughs> but these, by the way, these discussions are what we continue to have in the group. This is why I'm so interested in it because these insights on the different types of mentorship programs that we could uh, start launching at NumFocus is incredibly valuable uh, and how we want to run it because we have specific goals. They are, these are all different models. But uh, yeah, I'm curious how you guys measure success or like oh, no. <laughs> measure maybe where the, the students go, the mentees go afterwards. And, and is there even a way to do that? Just how do you approach this, this big problem? So I don't like quantitative metrics when it comes to these things because some of the numbers can be really depressing. <laughs> but I know there is a panel after this one happening like in the room next door about like measuring success with mentoring programs. So I'm excited to hear what they have to say on this. Um, but generally I try to set goals of like um, visibility. Like did you, you know, tweet about what you did can you write a blog post that we can promote so that more people can become aware of what you did? Um, yeah, metrics. <laughs> I think a good one that, that came up is getting repeat, getting mentees oh, yeah. that turn into mentors. Like that's just like, hey, we love the program. And that happens a lot in, you know, mentorship's been around for thousands of years. Medicine is a great example. People who go through the residency program and then stay at the university that they went through residency is kind of an indicator that, hey, there's a great program. Yeah. So that's that's one that I'm a huge fan of. Yeah. Um, so for Code Day, we, we think metrics in terms of short term, midterm, long term. So short term, how many students actually open their pull request and how many of them actually get merged? Um, we should probably track how long it takes too, because some of the projects are a little bit slow. Um, so yeah, short term, how many uh, open a pull request? And also, as you said, uh, blog posts, uh, things like that. Like, can you in in like you know, in a, in a concise way, actually talk about what you did because that's going to help you. Midterm, uh, how many students are continuing to contribute to a project? So we have 90% open a pull request, 40%, uh, uh, somewhere around 40% open their second pull request. Um, and then long-term, how many of them are getting internships? How many are getting jobs? Um, that's what the students want. Like, it's, it's great for all of us and like, we hope that they continue to contribute, but like, students want to get a job in the tech industry. That's, that's a large part of why they're doing what they're doing. And um, so, you know, if we can measure that and like we just scrape their LinkedIn profiles uh, periodically. Um, so I think we're about twice as much uh, in terms of getting an internship as compared to their peers who didn't do open source. And uh, it's like 12 percentage points higher, I think, on employment within six months of graduation. I am an academic, so I have to care <laughs> about measuring these Citation. things. It's like how we get people to like fund our programs. It's how I get papers published. Um, so, I mean, that being said, like, I'm not an evaluation person, but I am really interested in a lot of, like, related research. Actually, like, part of what drew me into open source as a way to engage students is there's a lot of research on uh, different factors that can help to attract and retain more diverse students to computing. And some of those are, like, a sense of belonging. Um, 
so feeling like you fit in a, in a particular community, um, having a strong STEM identity or thinking like about yourself, like identifying, I myself identify as a computer scientist. I didn't always. Um, other things like self-efficacy, that's like believing that like you can do a task, a specific type of task that's in front of you. Um, so those are like examples of some of the types of things I'm really interested in measuring. And last year we were like a super small pilot program. so. Our evaluation was like a lot of, the students did a lot of writing for the program and then I pulled from that writing, like you all are saying, blog posts and things. Um, so very qualitative. Um, but then we also did some surveys that also looked at just like quality of mentoring relationships. So there's also like, there's already like validated inventories out there that are assessing some of these things. Like my mentor respects me. I feel like those kinds of statements. Um, so we will, we're going to be working with an evaluator, which I'm super excited about. So hopefully like next year, if I'm back at the conference, I'll have more to report on the sorts of things we're studying, but um, hopefully also going to measure some of the things that you all have experience with, like where do students end up and yeah, what are they doing after the program? We're sort of on the other end of the spectrum because we are embedded within a class. We design a lot of these things in because we're in a class with our, our partner faculty. So like the students are getting a grade at the end of the day. So that's built in, you know, there's some stuff built in there because it's just as a function of the class. And uh, yeah, a part of it sort of at the long term, it is if the students get a job at the end of the, the thing. And uh, but during the class, there's tons of stuff that we, we put a lot of structures in. So like every week, just like a real engineer, you, you're supposed to put in a status update, right? Like green, green light, uh, yellow light, red light kind of thing. Um, the students and the student teams produce a ton of artifacts. They have uh, ship room documentation. Each of them has to say where they are, the what kind of code they're writing and stuff like that. And of course, the team first do a contribution together and then they do one each. And so that's, you know, a couple contributions. And then, um, yeah, we have like a survey kind of at the end. They're supposed to put the project on their LinkedIn and, you know, get ready for interview work. Your, their experience in the interview questions and practice that. And so, yeah, it's like class focused and job focused for us and all of those, the structure and the, the metrics and all that stuff is built towards that. So, so that's kind of, we just have a different starting point, right? Yeah. So. One, one other kind of like metric or connecting all of the, the funnels together that I've been working on um, is towards the end of the like programs, I try to get member companies, people that sponsor our foundation to come in to talk to the students and talk about like their company culture and how their company works with open source to kind of give them an idea of the opportunities available. And when there are applications available, they have one connection at that company already that can maybe help them get hired. So that's another uh, connection point that I hope to start having metrics around. I know we've had variety of um, students from more uh, externally organized programs like the Outreachy program get hired by our member companies, but hopefully these university partnership programs that I work on will start paying those dividends as well. <laughs> One, one more thing I wanted to mention really quickly um, that's kind of a fun one that I was just reminded of. We actually tr uh, ask mentors regularly, um, is the student employable as an intern or a new grad? Um, and uh, it's actually super fun. So there's a paper we published uh, a couple of years ago called Open Source Internships with Industry Mentors, if you want to take a look at the graph. But basically, we have this cool graph where week one, like it's, it's not great, it's like half, and then it actually goes down week two. <laughs> as the students really start to struggle, but then, you know, uh, and I think week three is also pretty low, but then like it, it climbs up pretty drastically from there um, because the students actually really start to figure out how to do engineering when you don't have someone who knows what to do. Um, so that's, that's been a really cool metric to track. It's, it's really satisfying to watch that go up. That's a really cool question. I think I'm going to start doing that actually with my mentors. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm genuinely curious about stuff now. We've not scripted this question, but I'm curious with your programs. Uh, do you have any programs that are like multi-year or like sort of intro, like onboarding to mentorship and then sort of an advanced course where it's like you're hireable, but now a theme this year, it seems at uh, the summit has been funding and sustainability in the space. So like maybe teaching how to speak to management about getting your organization involved in open source in a sustainability way. 
is there is there anything at that level or are we all on ramping so one of the universities i started working with in the last year valencia college they have a like two course program where the first one is more learning about like the fundamentals of cloud computing and how infrastructure works to support that and they get introduced to a mentor working on OpenStack, and then the second course is more like okay you have this mentor relationship established you're familiar with this project go do things so it is cool to see those sorts of programs evolved i would love to get that established at more universities because i think that that could be really valuable and bring more uh, really valuable for the students because they're able to spend more time and feel more confident by the time they graduate but also more value to the open source projects themselves because they've had people stick around long enough to become experts in it and are more likely to get hired and kept around within that community so in terms of pathways um in the way that we think about it is we have these like four week long like micro internships and the idea is get students ready for whatever they're going to do next and ideally they go get a paying internship and then they're like hitting the ground running you know the best intern in the class that's what we you know we, what we hope and if they don't we also have a summer program that's a little bit longer where they can sort of dive into things a little bit more and you know again like we're thinking of it in terms of building up on those skills the micro internship teaches them how to work as an engineer but they're making like a three line pull request and then the summer experience or the traditional internship they're making you know a much more complicated um, contribution uh, in terms of sustainability I mean I think ultimately we're looking at this as we should be providing a value to employers like you know ultimately if we can provide economic value in terms of these students not only being employable but ideally for code day we like to think of it as like new grad plus like we want them to be a little bit better than the people who haven't done something like this Long term, if we can do that, that's that's providing an economic value. Like that's something that we can sell to you know to employers. Um, we're also uh, Code Day is funded in part through a state budget in California, um, indirectly through CSUMB, um, and then uh, Code Day and Mint were did not pass, but we were in a state budget proposal uh, this year in Washington State. So I think that they're you know if we're de uh, delivering enough um, educational value, that's also kind of a you know a path that that uh, can be gone down. Yeah, so we've been doing this for four years and we're trying to figure out, you know, there's refinement every year as engineers, as we, we do, we like tweak here, tweak there. So we are partnering with Code Day. So junior year, they do the micro internship. And then, you know, if they end of the summer, they may do the, 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 the Code Day summer internship. And then the senior year, they do um, the, the embedded capstone uh, class with us and during, um, uh, their junior and senior year, they could career mentoring during the school year as well. Um, so it's kind of just giant wraparound, and depending on where the students where the students are at, they get on board and off board. But we try to provide as much wraparound service possible. And uh, we didn't think about this when we first started, but all of a sudden, like there's a whole area called like workforce development has all of a sudden taken interest in what we do um, because our students do, you know, they're tra traditionally a lot, like a lot of nursing and entry level jobs and they've somehow discovered us because our students get, you know, if they, they land in a tech role, they get very, very highly paid. Uh, and it is for areas like, you know, Washington State and Seattle, that's kind of, you know, you need that level of income for, for, you know, to sustain a family and, you know, uh, family, family living wage. And so there's, you know, I think, you know, Department of Labor, Workforce Development, Academia, uh, Legislature. So there's like, there, there seems to be this groundswell folks. And of course, industry uh, seems to be, there's like a little bit of a groundswell in this area, all with slightly different interest in it, but they all kind of end at the same place. Yeah, I was having a conversation with someone earlier this week and they were talking about campus uh, Campbell, like Campbell Soup, hiring a, an architect for the digital, I don't know. I don't know what they need, <laughs> but, but there's a lot of, supply chain. yeah, <laughs> supply chain security at soup factories. Uh, so there's the upskilling aspect and then there's the, it's, it's a really interesting space and I look forward to talking about it more May 23rd on our call. <laughs> let us pivot to the money part because it's come up a couple times. Uh, there's the value transaction between a, a business and a program you were just talking about, Tyler, and there's uh, the mentor like it, that was brought up, like it's a draining position. Some Sometimes, uh, well, actually, I don't know. Do you guys pay mentors? 
should should we find a way to pay mentors? <laughs> let's start there. Should mentors be paid in an ideal world? Yes. <laughs> yeah, that part's easy. I think the are they paid and how much are they paid is yeah. more challenging. Yeah. In an ideal world, they would because they bring so much value to the investment of future, you know, in, 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 in the students. But like functionally, as it stands today, sustainably, no, we would not be able to afford any like, yeah, for, for the number of students we, we mentor, we would have to cut it down by just some, you know, a factor of 10 or maybe something <laughs> larger. But, uh, but most of the folks that are mentoring are not doing it because they need the money. If they're, they're, they're needing money, they're in this for the wrong reason. They do it because they want to give back. So the motivation is not money. Um, sometimes, you know, like uh, previously in Teal's, we would pay for like the mentors like gas, we would give them gas cards and stuff. Most of the people are just like, no, I don't want it. Like, I don't want an extra tax form or stuff. I'm not ready to incorporate it. They're just like, just give it back to the schools. It's cool. Like, I'm, I'm fine, right? Like, so, so I, I think we're also in a privileged position where um, tech folks are uh, compensated well enough where that's much, much less of a factor. Yeah. So I would say, ideally, the companies that are employing people to work 100% upstream, yeah, 100% upstream, um, would, like, that would be enough for the mentors then to be able to mentor as much as they want and not get burned out because their focus is on the community and making that open source project a success because it's important to the company as we've heard this week a lot. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be like some sort of FTE percentage <laughs> yeah. could be a mentorship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Obviously, 100% of the time is not uh, as widely accessible at companies as, po as we would like. But uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> it'd be really great if we could get more people to work upstream 100% of the time or higher percentages at the very least. I will say, I, I shook my head no earlier, but we do have a couple partnerships with companies sort of along that line. It's definitely not 100%. Um, but uh, being a mentor actually drives a lot of value, even in terms of professional development. Like the mentors who go through this, we have mentors who went through this because they wanted an opportunity to, um, you know, see if they uh, could be a manager or learn some of those skills. And um, so we have some partnerships. I don't think I can talk about one of them, but we have two. Um, one of them's with a company called EBSCO. They make the library software. They make the open source software that powers the Library of Congress, which is very cool. Um, they, for three years now, have had mentors who, um, you know, they pay them for their time. Like the mentors are getting time off of their workday to mentor students in an open source project. And that has actually driven enough economic value for them just on the mentor side. The mentors are getting enough out of it, not even talking about hiring benefits and things like that, too. So, yeah, it, it is uh, sort of something, I guess, like they're sort of getting paid through their job directly to do this, which is kind of neat. So we're going to go to questions in just a minute. So get them ready if you got them. Yeah. So another thing I think people forget is that um, I didn't think about this, but like, you know, my previous uh, program, like Microsoft Teals, the, the amount of time and waking up, to, like how many software engineers want to wake up at six in the morning, drive to a local school, teach a period of like high school students and stuff, but they do it. It's because I think for a lot of folks, it, because they're working with students that are fairly new to computer science, it reminded them of themselves when they were when when they were there. And also, I think I didn't think about it, but a lot of the mentor said, like it reminded me why I fell in love with computer science in the first place. And it was very refreshing before. I mean, this was a morning one, super teals, super early in the morning. But like, it started their day off on the right foot for a lot of them. Before they go to all of the corporate meetings and stuff, they got to teach a class of kids who are like, you know, doing, you know, uh, you know, the light bulb goes off for like a for loop for the very first time. That sets them up for the week. Um, and a lot of our mentors, I would say for, for Mint, are so invested in our students' like success and when they get jobs. I would say they care about more about the students' careers sometimes than the students do. They're more excited. <laughs> Then, like, when a student gets a job offer, and I think their own career sometimes, I'm like, this is like, so I think, I think it's, you know, I think um, Emily mentioned earlier, it's about 
building and foster relationships with uh, people. Um, you know, open source just happened to the medium and computer science and open source happened to the medium. But at the end of the day, you know, we're all human beings. These are the things that we enjoy and we do things that we enjoy and have whatever the ROI happens to be. It doesn't have to be money. So but maybe fold into your, your response here. The, what would we do with money in this space in mentorship? Well, the, I can speak to that a little bit, maybe. I was Because I was about to say, like, actually, I want to advocate for something. Um, so we do, I mean, I was the main mentor for our program last year, but we did pay, like, like honoraria to guest mentors that interacted with the students. Um, we also are a mentor org for Google Summer of Code. Shout out to Stephanie Taylor, who's sitting over here. We, uh, Google Summer of Code also does pay mentors. Um, so that is, there are people out there who are doing that. Um, the, the thing that I was going to highlight is uh, because like we're working specifically with HBCU partners, like that means we're often engaging a lot of people who've historically been pretty marginalized in tech to then also come and like, you know, host students at their tech company for the day or come talk to them about what they're doing in tech. Um, and as we started to design the program, we were fortunate enough to have the funding to advocate for certain things. And it was important to me that we compensate the, those people who are spending the time. I think that uh, people who've been minoritized are often asked to do additional labor to help address that problem in tech. And so I think, yeah, it's just been really important to me on a personal level to like pay those people, advocate for the funding to pay those people. And I've seen the impact it has on the students when they've incidentally learned that those people were getting paid. They were like, whoa, like, that's really cool that you're valuing people's time that way. So I think if there was like more resources, it would be like, yeah, pay all the mentors, pay the people who are supporting the students. Like that's like a really big deal, even if they're people that are making livable salary. I, I would add to that more infrastructure stuff like this, because again, these are four different mentorship programs. There's so many more in the space and we need to stay connected because we learn from each other and like Num Focus wants to start our mentorship program. It's going to be a completely different animal, but we're going to learn from all of this. We're going to give back to that community as well. And we, we need resources to stand up that type of social infrastructure. Uh, with that, do we have any questions? Uh, do you have any influence over the cur curricula? Um, so for for us, we, uh, us and the mentors kind of get to decide what the projects are. Um, and usually it's, you know, it's something that the mentors might be somewhat familiar with, but not super like deep in. And then we go and have, you know, we have, we scope it with the faculty to do a sanity check. It's like, hey, what do you think about this, right? Like, or, or would your students be okay in this? And then it's a very positive feedback loop because the, just the way we work, we're embedded in the classroom. So the faculty see what the students are doing and then the mentors give feedback. We have that kind of relationship. So it's just a continuous feedback loop. It's like, okay, maybe we, next year we'll want to do a little bit of this, a little bit less of that. And so it just naturally evolves as, because they see all the student stuff, it's on the same platform. So they get to see all of the, what the students are doing, what they're discussing, what they're deciding. So, um, so yeah, so for us, it's just because we're embedded, it just, it's just naturally there. I would say um, I've had like a little bit of influence over it um, until recently. It's mostly just been making connections with university professors that are focused on cloud computing or infrastructure first, and then finding out like the structure of their particular syllabus if they want semester long projects or, or what they're trying to accomplish. Um, but I definitely, uh, because I work with OpenStack the most, and OpenStack is not on GitHub and all of its lovely stars, <laughs> we're actually on Garrett, I often end up being the like special flower in the group because all of the professors are familiar with GitHub and not many of them are familiar with Garrett. So I'm like, oh, but that's different. We don't, it's a different push versus pull model. And so there's a little bit extra teaching that our mentors end up having to do to like get the students to a point that they can contribute. Um, so that's been a, a 
fun ongoing thing. <laughs> but also, as I've developed these relationships with professors, I've started asking them for their syllabi to share with other professors that are interested in building curriculums and syllabi for particular courses um, in this space. So I'm trying to help connect the dots more too. Um, I've done all the curriculum for our program, so <laughs> it's me, you're looking at it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like I've, um, I developed and taught an open source semester long course uh, when I was teaching at Berea College, which is a liberal arts college in Kentucky. Um, I uh, also, yeah, did all the activities and stuff for the summer students that I have in the Contributor Catalyst program. Um, if that's something you're interested in, I'd love to talk more. There's also, for anyone in the room who's like looking for a curriculum or like looking for resources from more like that perspective, one resource for me on the academic side and how I got into all this is there's a working group called uh, Teaching Open Source or TOS. You can look them up online. They have a website. Um, they have a wiki. They have, it's, it's a mess because it's open source, but there are so many activities there that are like, I mean, that's, that's where I built my curriculum. I went to like one of their faculty professional development workshops. I started there and I like grabbed this activity and modified it and this activity and modified it. Um, so there's structure for students to do things like go like do like a FOSS field trip where they like visit projects online and assess whether this is going to be a friendly community for me and all that. Um, and to your second question about trends and languages, um, I don't have any great insight there, but that's, be <laughs> that's because um, I would say I don't pick projects based on the like tech stack. Like I know some people do that and I think it's a, like a good strategy, but um, I pick projects based on like friendliness and sort of historical like support for newcomers. Um, and then I also, I basically usually like narrow down to communities that I have a relationship with or, um, or know are gonna be welcoming. And then the students pick based on their personal interest, which could be language or um, just a sort of extracurricular. So like last year, the, the students I worked with were all really creative and they contributed to P5JS and had a blast. So um, yeah, so I think it, it just depends. All right, so unfortunately we're running really close or tight on time. So how many questions do we have? There's QR codes. Ask we, us questions. We can have a we can have like a hallway session outside <laughs> afterward. Or come to so, our call on May 23rd. Also, so come to the call. That that QR code on the left, the Get Involved one, will take you to a link tree. All of our emails are up there, as well as a link to the Discord where we have our our meetings once a month. First one's on May 23rd. Uh, you can also scan. Whoop! Perfect timing. Oh no! <laughs> you can also scan the one on the right. That will. Uh, get us your question and we can respond if you put your email in there. Oh, that's oh, annoying. No. Uh, <laughs> which one was that? The one on the left? Uh, the one on the left. Yeah, the Discord link. Okay. Well, what a fun time. <laughs> if try, you're interested in any those. of this, meet us outside the conference yeah. room. We'll figure it out. Yes. All right. Try the, uh, the Discord one. We've got a mailing list and then we've got that first call. <laughs> <laughs> they all worked last week. <laughs> I promise. You saw our names on a previous slide. You'll get in touch with one of us. Yes. We'll stand outside in the hallway. Yeah, yeah we'll stand outside in the hallway. <laughs> and the, the kickoff meeting will be at 11 a.m. Pacific or 2 p.m. Eastern, in case you're trying to mentally bookmark that, which I hope you are. Yeah. <laughs> and if you take a picture of those, I'll get the QR codes working. So you can scan your phone. I think, scan a picture of the QR code on your phone. But uh, thank you all the wonderful panels. Thank you for coming in.